Hello and welcome back. You're watching the PLZ Forum for Ecozoic Era 2020. The time here in Korea right now is exactly 10 a.m. And this is day two of the conference. We'll soon be starting session three. You've all had some breakfast and you were feeling rather energetic. We have a big day ahead of us with four sessions to get through. The topic for session three is diverse approaches to harmony with nature in the context of peacemaking in borderlands. Let me introduce to you the moderators and the presenters. The moderator is Dunya Krause, Research Officer at United Nations Research Institute for Social Development. For the presenters, we have Maria Mercedes Sanchez, the coordinator of the UN Harmony with Nature program. She's joining us from New Jersey. We also have David Havlik, professor of geography and environmental studies at University of Colorado, joining us from Colorado. And we also have in the studio, Dr. Chung Hae Kang, professor of law at University of Seoul, and also Taehyun Park, Professor of Law at Kangwon National University. Also, we have Jan Bao Wang, Research Fellow and Director, Center for the Humanities and Business Ethics and Research Center in China. Let us get started with session three. Thank you very much and welcome uh, also from my side to this session at the International Conference on Development, Environment and Peace Nexus or DEEPEN, Peacemaking in Borderlands, and particular to this session that looks at the diverse approaches to harmony with nature in the context of peacemaking. This conference, as you know, is organized uh, by the UNA Research Institute for Social Development or UNRIST in short and People for Earth with support from Gangwon Provincial Government and Cheowon County Government of the Republic of Korea, which I want to acknowledge as we're very grateful for this support. My name is Dunia Kauser. I'm a research officer leading the environmental and climate justice program at UNRIST, and I'm very happy to be chairing this session today. In this session, our panelists will address the opportunities and challenges of diverse approaches to the environment or nature for peacemaking in the context of borderlands. Through the different presentations, we will look at a range of concepts that differ from mainstream and Western dominated approaches to nature and explore what these alternatives can offer for peacemaking in the context of borderlands. We will examine how these concepts have been applied in practice and discuss the implications of the diverse approaches to environment or nature for peacemaking in the context of borderlands. I'm joined here today by a fantastic group of panelists, both live in person and virtually on Zoom, who will share some of the insights and reflections with us. We will uh, first hear all of the presentation, some of which have been pre-recorded for technical reasons, and then have time for questions and answers at the end of our sessions. But before we start, allow me to make some brief announcements. The session is being recorded and live, stream, live streamed via YouTube, where it will remain available afterwards. You can also find the recordings of the other conference sessions on the Chair One Forum YouTube channel in case you missed any of them. On the YouTube live channel, you will see that we have enabled the comment section. Please use that to submit questions you would like to post directly to one or several of our speakers and indicate who you are addressing. We will collect the questions and depending on how many we receive, we will select some for the discussion after we heard all five presentations. Please note that you can also use likes to indicate your support for questions or comments that seem most relevant to you. We also encourage you to make use of that function as it will help us identify which questions and comments most people would like to see addressed. At the very end of the session, we'll also share with you a link to a concise three question feedback survey and would really appreciate your help uh, in filling that in. But now without further ado, let's move to our first presentation. We will start with Maria Mercedes Sanchez, who is the coordinator of the UN Harmony with Nature program. Maria Mercedes has over 20 years of experience in the field of sustainable development in intergovernmental processes, such as the preparations leading to the adoption of the 2030 agenda. Since the inception of the UN Harmony with Nature program in 2009, she has been coordinating and leading the program's work in support of Earth's jurisprudence principles and will talk to us today about the UN Harmony with Nature program as a non-anthropocentric worldview.
It gives me great pleasure to participate in this conference organized by UNRIST and People for Earth. I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation and extend warm greetings to the speakers who are participating and to the audience that is following this event online. I will start my presentation with a quick overview of the UN Harmony with Nature program, which started over 10 years ago in 2009, when the UN General Assembly declared 22nd April International Mother Earth Day and adopted the same year the first General Assembly Resolution on Harmony with Nature. The essence of the program resides in non-anthropocentrism or Earth-centered worldview, often referred to as Earth jurisprudence. And in this sense, we have commemorated annually 22nd April with UN interactive dialogues of the General Assembly, with UN reports on harmony with nature, as well as one expert's report in 2016. To date, the General Assembly has adopted 12 resolutions on harmony with nature. It has hosted 10 dialogues on harmony with nature and 10 UN reports, as well as a supplement to the 2020 report have been published, along with the publication of the 2016 experts report. The program shares knowledge on non-anthropocentrism through a dedicated website, social media, Facebook and Twitter accounts, monitoring the implementation of the rights of nature in law and policy, and a knowledge network of scholars and practitioners working on non-anthropocentric teachings, and the program draws from their work. I encourage you to visit our website and to follow us on social media. At the end of my presentation, you will find a slide containing the website and social media information just mentioned. Given the breadth and depth of Earth jurisprudence, we have addressed it over the years from the following eight disciplines, Earth-centered law, ecological economics, education, holistic science, humanities, philosophy and ethics, the arts, media, design and architecture, and theology and spirituality. I will now give you a few highlights of the UN Harmony with Nature program. The non-anthropocentric worldview of living in harmony with nature draws from the cosmovision of indigenous peoples who relate to the land in a way that stems from centuries of observation and interaction with nature and considers nature as sacred and humanity as part of nature. Their interaction with the land is to ensure balance between what the land produces and what they need in terms of, for example, fertile soil, food and medicines. Indigenous lands make up around 20% of the earth territory, containing 80% of the world's remaining biodiversity. And conservation of biodiversity has been possible due to the relationship indigenous peoples have with the natural world. They view themselves as part of nature, and it is in this relationship that lies the way they interact with nature. Nature is considered a relative, family, not a resource. They understand that the meaning of life hangs in the balance of coexistence between all life and that such balance is grounded in the values and ethics associated with the belief that the law is in the land, it is not in man. For indigenous peoples, the key to sustainability and to assuring a healthy planet lies in restoring humanity's broken relationship with the land and with nature as a whole. This is reflected in the cosmovision of the indigenous people of the Andes when they refer to Suma Kaksuai or Buen Vivir, good living, meaning good living in harmony with our communities, ourselves, and most importantly, our living, breathing environment, nature as a whole. The non anthropocentric perspective of living in harmony with nature, while having its roots in indigenous philosophy, governance, and ways of life, is by no means exclusive to the indigenous people of the Andes. It can also be found in many other ancient civilizations, cultures, and spiritualities worldwide, which share the same relationship between humankind and Mother Earth. Therefore, this non-anthropocentric worldview contrasts sharply with our current anthropocentrism, in which we view ourselves separate from nature, and our relationship to the natural world is best exemplified in the prevailing logic of profitability as the raison d'etre for our current growth-based economic system in which nature is just a resource. Likewise, recognizing nature as a subject of law 
contrast sharply with current environmental protection laws, which are anthropocentric, address the consequences of a dysfunctional system, and perpetuate the problem by supporting the unsustainable economic paradigm based on infinite growth. Western legal tradition in which we are enmeshed recognizes only two categories of personhood, a natural person or human being, and an artificial person or a human creation, such as a corporation or an association. However, over the last decade, the recognition that nature has rights or legal personhood is increasingly being recognized by law. The law has registered significant changes by acknowledging that nature is not an object, but a subject with rights or has legal personhood, hence the rights of nature or the rights of Mother Earth. Furthermore, there has been growing recognition of the customary laws of indigenous peoples in constitutional and international law, as well as growing awareness that recognition of the rights of nature is embedded in customary laws, in contrast to modern environmental laws which remain grounded on an anthropocentric worldview. For example, the following rulings provide evidence of indigenous narratives being recognized for the first time as an integral part of the concept of legal pluralism, and their views are being accepted in a positivistic system of law. On 7 November 2019, the Constitutional Court of Guatemala recognized that water is a living entity with cycles that connected with the cosmos and that is a guardian spirit for the Maya people. On 12 November 2019, in Colombia, the Special Jurisdiction for Peace recognized Katsasu, the vast territory of the Awa people, as a subject of rights and a victim of the armed conflict. On 1st April 2020, an unprecedented court settlement in favor of the Ashinanka people in the Brazilian Amazon guaranteed reparations for crimes committed almost 40 years ago against the Ashinanka people whose lands were deforested in the 1980s to supply the European furniture industry. The above mentioned examples provide a glimpse of a larger picture that has been unfolding over the last decade, and indigenous peoples have started to formalize this belief through Western law. In the past 50 years, although acknowledgement has grown that human rights are intertwined with the environment in which we live, Environmental laws have largely failed to reduce pollution and prevent species and habitat loss on which human rights depend. Furthermore, warnings of unsustainable development since the 1960s, backed by evidence from scientists about concentrations of greenhouse gas emissions, deforestation and species extinctions in reference to production and consumption, have led to what is known as the sixth mass extinction. The loss of biodiversity from terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems continues to increase at rates unprecedented in human history. At present, the new non-anthropocentric understanding of the law, or Earth-centered law, recognizes nature as sentient being with rights, regardless of her utility to humankind. This new understanding of the law further advances that a legal system, incapable of aligning itself for example, with the, with the cycles of water and food production, is bound to collapse. Therefore, by encoding a new paradigm in law, society will start to operate in a different direction, leading us to regeneration instead of destruction. Gonzalo Soso, professor of private law in the Law and Social Sciences Faculty of the National University of Litoral in Santa Fe, Argentina, explains that one of the fundamental reasons for the lack of effectiveness of environmental law in protecting nature lies in the fact that it never replaced the idea of endless exploitation of the planet facilitated by modern private law with the concept of sustainability. In other words, the weakness of environmental law is directly linked to the fact that it always stopped at the door of private law. Klaus Bosselmann, Professor of Environmental Law and Founding Director of the New Zealand Centre of Environmental Law at the University of Auckland, further highlights that environmental law entered the game when all the cars had already been drawn. And the new environmental public law of the 1960s and 1970s added only a few environmental duties to private property rights without restrictions. Environmental 
law has therefore continued to be the poor relative of property and commercial law and can only promote insufficient measures on the periphery thereof. To date, over 370 pieces of legislation and policy combined have been adopted or are in the works in 35 countries. NGOs, civil society organizations, legislators, and legislative bodies are working together to draft, adopt, and implement laws or policies recognizing nature as a subject of rights and or legal person protected by law. Elected officials, legislators, and NGOs are gaining the tools needed to make informed decisions on the basis of scientific knowledge, the wisdom of ancient cultures, and their personal experience regarding the impacts of a dysfunctional relationship between humans and nature. Along with young people, they are the drivers for major transformation in the way global society functions and interacts with the natural world. The key role played by academia and many NGOs must be underscored in both formal and informal education. And as a result of public engagement, there is growing awareness and understanding of this legal paradigm. Many schools, universities, and academic institutions have introduced or strengthened their curricula in relation to Earth jurisprudence, which recognizes that human interconnectedness with nature is a prerequisite for ecological sustainability and should be recognized as the foundation of our legal system. While public engagement has grown in diversity, with a shared goal of increasing awareness and understanding of this legal paradigm. In this regard, I would like to refer you to the supplement to the 2020 UN report on harmony with nature, which provides ample information in this regard. To conclude, with the acceleration of climate change and ecosystems being pushed to collapse, the human right to a healthy environment cannot be achieved without securing nature's own right first. More precisely, the human right to life is meaningless if the ecosystem that sustain humankind do not have the legal rights to exist. Furthermore, the rights of each sentient being are limited by the rights of all other beings to the extent necessary for the maintenance of the integrity, balance, and health of larger ecological communities. Values advanced by these paradigms such as equity, cooperation, dialogue, inclusion, comprehension, agreement, respect, and mutual inspiration complement the same aspirations posited by ecological economics in the journey to move beyond the Anthropocene epoch. While it is early to know the effects that rights of nature legislation will have in securing peace in borderlands, in particular where indigenous people live and are at the forefront of threats caused by extractive industries such as logging, gas, oil, and mining, industries threatening not only the land, water, and air, but indigenous people's livelihoods and cultures, it is important to highlight that many of the new laws being adopted in, regi in regions with indigenous and Afro communities often act as guardians of their biocultural rights. Finally, I would like to draw your attention to two recent events. The first one took place in Orange County, Florida, which, as a result of the November 3rd election, became largest municipality in the U.S. to adopt a rights of nature law. The second one, at the request of the European Economic and Social Council, a study titled Towards an EU Charter of the Fundamental Rights of Nature, was published on 17 November and aims to set a framework for the legal recognition of the rights of nature in the European Union legal order as a prerequisite for a different and improved relationship between human beings and nature. It is my sincere hope that as we resurface from the COVID-19 pandemic, we reconnect with the land and with each other in regenerative ways to meet everyone's basic needs and that our renewed consciousness for peace on earth starts first by making peace with her. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Maria uh, Mercedes, for this great overview. I don't know if people can see it. We on Zoom are applauding you. Um, 
And I'm sure this was really helpful for our audience as well to uh, learn more about Earth's law and the importance of rights of nature. Before we dive deeper into questions of Earth's jurisprudence, let us first hear more about borderlands. We will uh, hear David Havlick's pr um, presentation, and we already heard that he is a professor of geography and environmental studies at the University of Colorado. His research focuses on militarized landscapes, restoration geographies, conservation and public lands, and he's been supported by the National Science Foundation, American Geographic Society, and US Forest Service. He's published quite widely and won the 2019 J.D. Jackson Prize from the American Association of Geographers for his book, Bombs Away, Militarization, Conservation, and Ecological Restoration. The title of his presentation is The Contested Nature of Borderlands, Ecology, Culture, and Policy. Over to David's presentation. Hello, my name is David Havlick. I'm a professor of geography and environmental studies at the University of Colorado in Colorado Springs. And uh, I'm super grateful to, to be able to participate in this conference uh, virtually. I wish I could be there in person with you all, but um, I'm not. So uh, here I am uh, via computer. <laughs> um, and my talk today is, is focusing on the contested nature of borderlands. Um, and before I begin, I just want to, to quickly thank uh, Il Chang Yi and Aaron Hong and your colleagues there at the UN and People for the Earth uh, for, for inviting me and for organizing this conference. So my talk today, I'll be focusing on two different areas. One is the DMZ, uh, which I have not managed to visit. And so the, the, I mostly have questions for you about the experience of, of being there and, and what visitors encounter there. Um, but then the second area that I want to highlight uh, is an area that I have had a chance to research over the past 35 years in different ways, and that's the Central European borderlands, um, the former Iron Curtain borderlands, um, where there's been a number of changes that have really been characterized by a shift from conflict to peacemaking. So when we think about opportunities in borderlands and in um, peacemaking areas, um, I think there's some broad features that are worth highlighting, broad opportunities that are, are probably common to many of these areas. Um, probably first and foremost are the increased safety and the reduced political tensions that come um, as we transition from conflict to peacemaking. Um, along with those or following those are often economic and cultural um, re kind of, uh, resurgences or, or revitalizations. Um, oftentimes coming in the forms of different kinds of tourism. So whether it's recreational tourism uh, in kind of protected areas and open space or heritage tourism or military tourism, historical tourism, lots of different forms of tourism. And I think even before transitions uh, fully uh, transpire, these tourist draws, uh, these tourist uh, opportunities occur um, already, for instance, along the DMZ, of course, there are tens of thousands of tourists who come each year to, um, to see what's going on there and to observe and kind of engage with uh, the transitions that are underway there. Uh, environmental conservation is one of the attributes of voter lands that I've studied um, the most. And uh, many times these are opportunities that are not necessarily planned but are discovered kind of over time as borderlands are kept off limits to other people, other kinds of human activities. Nature in a sense fills that void or, or, or flourishes in the absence of human encroachment and human activity. And so when borderlands that have been characterized by conflict or tension for decades then transition and they're characterized by, by peacemaking, there are these new harmonies of, of the, for the environment that also then emerge or are brought to, to the foreground. And I think, you know, in combination, these different kinds of opportunities, these different transitions that occur can also really provide us a source of hope and inspiration um, for many of us who study them or observe them or encounter them. And I think that's important, um, you know, how these places affect us. So along with these opportunities and these, what I, what I think are really some positive aspects of peacemaking along borderlands, uh, there are also some challenges that I think uh, think are, are worth highlighting and are important to keep in view. And first among these is probably uh, for me is the, is the prospect of uh, erasing the history of these sites. And this can happen when we naturalize the violence and the social dislocation that has occurred here. 
uh, I think there's a there's an overriding that occurs, and sometimes um, uh, a hazardous blurring of militarization and conservation, where we can, if we view conservation as the product, um, in, in a weird sense, in a sort of perverse sense almost, that it was a gift of these places being militarized that gives us then um, or produces their conservation outcomes. I think that that's potentially problematic and can can um, lead us also to embrace these periods of, of violence and militarization that are perhaps not what we're, we're trying to do. Um, so I, I think it's important that we accommodate and celebrate these periods of change or these transitioning um, processes without losing the cultural meaning. And I think that that's possible to do. I think that's a challenge we can rise to meet. And if we do so, that we um, will come to understand these places more thoroughly uh, in their sort of the full richness of of their history and their meaning and their ecologies and their social attributes. So I think it's a challenge that's 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 worth sort of acknowledging and, and worth rising to to accept. So thinking about the the DMZ in Korea again, I haven't been there, and so really what I have is questions about this place. Um, what what experiences do visitors find when they come to the DMZ? What messages are conveyed to visitors? How are the names and attractions presented to people? Is this framed, you know, I think even just the term demilitarized zone is potentially confusing. People come there and think that maybe it's a place uh, where militarization or danger or violence uh, is no longer so much of a concern. Presumably when you go there and you see soldiers and watchtowers and barbed wire and, and fortifications, um, that idea would, would sort of diminish, but there can, can be some potentially confusing messaging surrounding just what is this place. Um, and so as places change, as the names change, I think we have to be careful about what, what meaning gets attached to those changing names. Um, in, the, in the case of the European borderlands, we've seen a, a transition in, in nomenclature from thinking of that area as the Iron Curtain borderlands to now being called the European Green Belt or the Green Belt of Europe. And as those names shift, I think um, there can be a real uh, change in, in sort of associations with those places. Many times the opportunities or the, the interactions we have as visitors to these borderlands are curated or brought to us through a certain lens. Certain perspectives are highlighted Others are maybe uh, underrepresented. And so one, another question I would have about when people come to a place along the DMZ is whether the complexity of the place and the, and the nuanced history, um, the complicated history of the borderlands are, are brought into view or whether tourists come and simply see conflict or nature or peace and that these, and whether these are sort of brought into view as, as disconnected outcomes, um, when in fact, I think that it, it would be more informative, it would provide better understanding if people are led to, to um, conceptualize these as related processes to understand that conflict and nature and peace are intertwined in some, some important and uh, deep ways. So I, I'd be curious to see if that comes through uh, in the curated experiences people um, encounter at the at the DMZ. In my experiences along the uh, Central European borderlands, I first uh, crossed the, these borders during the, the, the Cold War in the mid-1980s when there were fortifications and checkpoints and it was very much a militarized zone to get into Eastern Europe or into to the city of Berlin. And then um, more recently, I was able to visit and, and bicycle along portions of the Iron Curtain Trail, which now extends for pretty much the full length of the, the Central European borderlands. And, and what I discovered as I um, sort of compared those different periods of visitation and the more recent visit in particular, was that there were processes of erasure and commemoration that were both evident in different places and in different times, and that these did seem to coexist but that there was sort of an uneasy coexistence. And there, there were places um, moving through these borders where it was, it was really difficult to imagine that there had ever been fortifications or barriers or danger in, in these 
areas. Um, and then there are other places where that, that history or that danger was very much still evident or vivid or um, kind of sparked the imagination. And so I think in different places, very different kinds of responses are possible. Um, and, and one of the, I think, the real important messages that comes out of the Central European borderlands, what's now called uh, frequently the, the European Greenbelt, is that the changes that occurred there did not occur by virtue of nature alone. It wasn't simply that nature reclaimed these abandoned spaces, but that it was the product that, that what the conditions that we find today are really the product of um, a whole set of, of, of other processes and actors uh, coming to bear here. And when I had a chance to meet with um, Mikhail Kramer, who's a, a member of the European Parliament, who was really responsible for uh, for catalyzing some of these these um, commemorative routes in the Central European borderlands, he emphasized that we we can't only look to nature to explain the changes that have taken place, um, that that would be crazy, and that culture, politics, nature, and history all need to be considered together if we're to truly understand and come to terms uh, with these borderlands, even in a time of peace, um, because of their histories and, and the processes that have come to bear upon these sites. So I wanna think about um, how we can um, memorialize what's happened in the past without sort of getting bogged down in it. I think it's, it's important to acknowledge that change happens and to move forward to the future and to embrace that future at some level. Um, but I think it's interesting, you know, in my visits to the, to the Central European borderlands, I was really struck at how deliberate the efforts were to not lose sight of those histories. And I think that's important and this is maybe something that is worth keeping in mind um, when thinking about the DMZ as well. And I, and I wanna sort of caution here and, and acknowledge that the context for what happened in Europe are very different than the context of, that, are, that exist in, in Korea. So it's not to say here that what happened in Central Europe will happen in Korea or should happen in Korea necessarily, but it's more to um, highlight what what we've seen happening in Europe, and to you know ask how that may inform, or whether that should inform um, some of the efforts that are that are taking place and the the future um, processes that 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 we pursue or that we see happen in Korea. So in terms of memorialization, I think the the Probably the most obvious or most explicit way that that's that's being been done in, in the European case is through maps and texts and photos, sort of before and after photo series that that remind people in a very kind of visual way um, of those that time of separation, those decades of separa separa separation and um, militarization that that existed here. So the the map at the top shows a portion of that Iron Curtain Trail bicycle route and the, the green sign down below um, is one of the, the signs from along that trail. This is a 10,000 kilometer long cycle route, one of the longest cycle routes in, in the world. And as I mentioned, as you proceed through, there are times when you would never know that you're pedaling through a, a mil formerly militarized borderland and other times when it's quite vivid, but I think the signage, you know, it's um, there's an effort, a very gentle but steady effort to, um, Keep in view, you know, the, the strands of, of barbed wire in the sign saying Iron Curtain Greenway. There's some iconography there that, that indicates like this isn't just a natural area. Similarly, the, the brown sign there um, throughout the, the German, um, throughout Germany where it used to be separated from east and west, there are these signs at every road crossing where it used to be a border, um, border crossing that remind us of that period of separation and also the exact moment when when that separation ended. So there's a sort of historical point that is, is demarcated and vividly sort of brought um, brought to us. In a number of communities, they've they've gone to some effort to create open air museums to represent more tangibly uh, the, the the prior condition of of these borderlands during those periods of conflict and Cold War tension. Um, this is near the, the small town of, of uh, Moedlerruth in, in Germany, where they um, just moved around and sort of reassembled the different infrastructures from 
that Cold War period from the watchtower to the fences, to the walls, to the runs where the dogs were, were stationed, um, to the electric fences and spotlights and tank barriers, all these things that were part of that um, kind of fearsome, highly militarized borderland that, that now seems quite peaceful and, and green and open and uh, tranquil in a lot of places. Um, I think it, it's, it's constructive actually to have these reminders there. Imagine school groups being brought there for field trips, visitors coming to uh, just to see what what this what this looked like not so very many years ago. You know, um, 30, 35 years ago, uh, this is what um, this area would have looked like. Um, and, and some of these are quite elaborate, some are very, very modest, but there are um, uh, several dozen of these open air museums scattered along the Iron Curtain borderlands, I think. So it's, it's another indication of the intentionality, that effort to make that history uh, not fade from view in, in a literal sense. More modestly, um, but I think kind of in some ways almost more strikingly, there are these kind of spontaneous remnants that remnants of border fortifications that still exist uh, on the landscape. Um, the, the wall at the top uh, was actually it was being dismantled. The locals in, in the 1989, when the border was opening up um, in Germany, were out there with sledgehammers, you know, smashing the wall. And the mayor actually the, of the local town came running out and said, you know, wait, 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 let's let's keep a little bit of this wall in place, shall we? Uh, in order to remind us in the future, maybe as as our generation fades or dies and the next generation comes up, they may not remember what this was like. And let's leave some scraps of this barrier behind so that we don't forget. Um, similarly, there's there's pieces of fence line. There, there are lots and lots of the old guard towers, the watchtowers that are kind of just left out in the landscape, kind of falling to ruin. This is something, this is a process that the geographer Caitlin DeSilvi calls curated decay. Uh, and in, in some cases it's not so curated, it's just sort of decay. But in other cases, it's, it's very, I think, intentional and deliberate to let these um, these towers and these fences kind of fall gradually to ruin um, in the interest of people thinking about the, I think both the time scale and kind of the, the, the processes in these places. So there's a, there's a temporal and a, a spatial element that come together in, in some of these um, ruined pieces of the border that's, that are left standing and are still out there. Perhaps, um, for me, what was what was most striking as I encountered these landscapes um, were the different kinds of artworks that were installed or or done both sort of formally and informally. Many, many, many different kinds of of art that were um, evident along the borderlands, and uh, in in their own ways, I think all of these evoked and provoked, in certain ways, um, visitors to think about what had happened here. So you know. The, the iron sculpture at the top of sort of the body falling may, may be evocative of, of you know, violence or death or certain kinds of, of um, actions that may be different than the, the large sculpture with the, the shackles and the broken chains and, and sort of the list of names of people who had died in that area of the, of the border um, uh, in the Czech Republic is, is where that uh, orange, the rust colored sculpture was. Um, and then some of these are actually kind of more abstract. So the, the image, the, 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 the sculpture with the, the knocked over chair and kind of the empty frame of the house, um, that's just up the hill from a village that was um, forcibly evacuated, uh, basically over the span of a few days. And this, this art was, was later installed at the, at, the, at the top of the hill. And if you didn't know the story of that village being kind of removed, you might wonder, well, why is there this chair in this frame? But it might also ask, it might also move you as a visitor to inquire, like, what did happen here? And what does this symbolize? And I think that open-endedness of interpretation and exploration and, and sort of inquisitiveness is really productive in terms of engaging people to think about the history, but in a way that's not static but that is, is kind of growing and evolving over time. So I, th I think um, 
one way of thinking about these kinds of processes and, and the, the complexity that's that's involved is to think about these areas as contested natures, um, that they're landscapes that that don't just exist in, in one form or another and don't just happen by chance, but that are really the, the product of um, human and natural processes coming together and they create these complex layered meanings and existences in these places. And part of that that's really important, I think, is that the ecology and culture do come together, that they, they're in conversation with each other and that they interact with each other and that they're um, managed or preserved kind of together in a sense. And so I think it's, 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 it's really key, I would argue, to try to embrace both ecological and social changes without losing the meaning of these places. And in fact, I think if we do this well, we can embrace the ecological and the social changes and actually add meaning uh, and, and, and sort of inspire and, and motivate meaning coming from these landscapes. And I think that's ideally what these places will do for us is for us to think and to understand and to inquire. So then to come back to the case of the DMZ and the, the Korean example, um, as we find there, or as we come to present this area in different ways and to interpret this region in different ways, uh, I think it's worth asking how the different terms we use perhaps invite different policy responses, how the different terms engage people at the local and the regional scale. Is it, do these terms um, motivate people who live in the area to think differently or to respond differently to these borderlands? And then also at the national or international scale, when people are, are trying to create policy or think about measures that maybe are appropriate um, along the, the 38th parallel, does it matter if we call it a peace and life zone or a demilitarized zone? And what are the, what are the consequences of, of those, those presentations or those representations? Um, and my hope is that, that the way we present the area can steer us towards the direction of embracing the social and the ecological um, and not at the exclusion of one or the other. So with that, I wanna um, thank you for, again, for listening, for, for inviting me to participate. And I look forward to any questions or conversations we may have uh, that follow, thanks. Thank you so much, David, uh, for highlighting the meaning of borderlands and how those can change over time as we make peace, and also for bringing up the complexity of human environment relations in borderlands. Before we move on, let me remind you that you can already submit questions for our panelists while you listen to the presentations using the YouTube comments section. We will collect them and aim to address them uh, at the end. Now, we will move to Korea. Um, into the actual uh, place where we were all meant to be for this conference. Our next presentation will be delivered by Professor Chung Hei Kang, who uh, from the law school of the University of Seoul, uh, and who is a lawyer and also holds a Bachelor of Laws from Seoul National University and a Master of Laws from UC Berkeley. She's published a number of books and articles in areas ranging from commercial law to social enterprises and environmental law, as well as alternative dispute resolution. The presentation uh, that you will give us today will focus on borderlands as a nexus of ecological development and earth law in the context of stakeholders. Professor Kang, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you for the invita invitation. Uh, and, um, 네, 우선 한국어로. Please allow me to speak in Korean. As you are well aware, so my title of the presentation is pretty long. It says, Borderlands as a nexus between ecosystem development and arts law in the context of stakeholders. Actually, it is a pretty lengthy, but before to begin with, I did like to highlight the key concept of my presentation for you to have a better understanding because the law is a very professional area. So if you don't study law, you feel it's too professional and too specific and difficult to understand. And the key concept of my presentation is about borderlands and earth law. 
and stakeholders. So I'd like to talk about the relations of these three. And the stakeholder is a legal terms used in the commercial law and corporate law. 그래서 이 stakeholder so the concept of the stakeholder will be used to develop and deliver my concept and my idea because some something that have been interested in the border areas are largely state and nations. So under the big frame of nation, we have been discussed about how we can deal with borderlands like DMZ. So the specific uh, characteristics of a borderlands as a small community has never been largely uh, discussed because of that the big framework. Basically, by making, by making shift from the state to Every stakeholder in the borderlands, I'd like to deliver my arguments. In fact, there are so many stakeholders in borderlands, which includes nation and states. And many of issues around the borderlands are coming from the nation perspective. For example, smuggling, uh, refugees, and the violent conflict. I think all of that issues have been originated if you look at the borderlands from the nation's perspective. And if we only limited to see the DMZ from the nation perspective, then the ecological identity like rivers, mountains, and the community and the inhabitants might not be understood. So we have to understand there are many stakeholders in borderlands and their interest and their perspective should be understood. To include that, we have to establish a new legal system and to make that happen, we have to have some legal new legal, new legal thinking that is why we need to have Earth's law. As you are well aware, Borderlands has many different stakeholders. And so far, they have, they have been understood under the existing legal framework. Simply speaking, they have been ignored. So some natural entities who have been ignored and local community and people living in that area and their locality should be viewed and understood for us to have a comprehensive look then we are able to set out a new legal system that requires us to make a shift from the existing legal framework to a new framework. Borderlands like DMZ is based on very small unit and they have a very specific locality. If you compare the area of DMZ against to the total area of Korea, it's very easy to understand you how small it is. And that small unity is really important. Sometimes we ignore small villages, but the small villages can be a very basic and the baseline to create a big frame and the big relations with the total area. And But if you look into the modern legal system, we largely focus on the fragmented and individualized legal factors and elements. And the sovereignty of a nation has been has getting a lot of uh, the attention because they are protecting many other individualized elements. So the borderlands, which considered as a small area, are fragile to fragile or a fragile or the borderlands can be on have been understood from the very specific perspective such as smuggling, 
tar tariff, things like that. But what we have to understand is that they have some strengths that the others do not have because it's very small and narrow area. So local inhabitants have an access to every small uh, happening in their locality. And also they have a very high level of uh, responsibility for the issues happening inside of their community. Inst so instead of the central government to have control on that small community, uh, the small community itself can autonomously control themselves as based on their better and the qu high quality understanding of their own community. So if we make a shift to community-based thinking, then we may understand what needs to be done to protect ecosystem and all the fauna and flora in that region as a whole. That means we can create a new legal system that governs that local area then that help us achieve our goals sooner in that borderlines. So to make a new legal system and legal thinking possible, and that happens thanks to the Earth's law, let's deep dive into the legal law, the Earth's law. Um, actually, the legal law can avoid some legal perspective. What I frequently use in the explanation of a legal law is legal person. As you may aware, when it comes to the law and regulations, we usually use a lot of the jargons and the legal person is a key concept in the Earth law. So let me just start with the legal person. In the past, the legal person considered as natural person. Legal person is only given to a people. However, it has expanded to cover some the abstract entities like legal entity or companies states, any others that can be seen in the human eyes. And the, from the history of a legal person, it has expanded its coverage from the natural person to abstract entity, such as company and organization. It's very important because granting the legal person means that they can argue for their the rights, and if their rights is abused or damages, then they can uh, claim for the reimbursement or the recovery of their rights. And throughout that, they can create their own orders and some system. But so far, some couple of countries like New Zealand try to give a legal person to nature, like mountains and river. There were few cases around the world, but it's very rare and uncommon. So from that perspective, our existing legal thinking and legal system has ignored natural ecosystem and many other natural entities. We have been very negative and unwilling to give legal person to the nature. Uh, we are having a new area to focus on giving legal person to every uh, the living things in the world, that is the Earth's law. For example, there is a villages comp uh, in the DMZ, then we can grant the legal person to that community. In reality, here in Korea, there are some cooperatives and social enterprises and Newly, they were given legal persons. So the legal persons giving and the legal system 
have made those industries become very active. So I think, and we need to give a legal person to specific community, small community. By doing so, they can achieve some autonomy and autonomous to achieve their goals. So we, from that reason, for that reason, we need to have our law. If we introduce the legal law, then the fragmented and individualized legal rights protection has not only limited to the national sovereignty, but also the ecosystem and living creatures like mountains and fauna and flora and some locality and community and many other abstract things. Of course, other tangible things included. By doing so, we can create a new order. And the intersection of that should be and will be borderlands. One good example is DMZ. So the new legal system or the Earth law can support some areas that have not been supported by the existing law, which is individualized and fragmented. So this new system focus on the relationship because it does not individualize or fragment all that area, but they try to understand the situation as a whole based on largely relations. And it brings about a new legal system and new way of thinking and new way of understanding. So let me just wrap it up. Some borderlands like the MG are having all different uh, the stakeholders intertwined, which should receive legal persons. We have to get away from the existing way of thinking that largely focus on the nation and state. But from the Oslo perspective, we have to view the community and the borderlands and create a new legal system and new legal order to protect the ecosystem and going beyond to pr preserve the locality of that community. Just as the previous presenter, Professor David Havley mentioned that, that I also agree that naming is critical. When we are working on the laws and regulations, we have to get away of the framework, state versus state we have to come up with a new naming. I think that that's possible. When there is a new naming of a European Green Belt, just like that, we may call it Korean Green Belt instead of a DMZ or a Korean Peace Belt. We have to have a new name for the DMZ. I totally agree with um, Professor David Havlik, I got uh, your presentation was enlightened me. So the new legal thinking, the in new introduction of the Earth law is very important from that perspective. By making that paradigm shift we can suggest a new concept and new legal system. That's what I expect. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, we applaud you for this presentation as well. I think it was really interesting. Um, and I think 
for us working in the international system, we use the term stakeholders quite a lot, but I would say, unfortunately, not yet in ways that include nature or ecosystem members in the definition. So Earthlow is really a promising approach in that regard. Um, now, let us move uh, on to our next live presentation, which will be delivered by Taeyeon Park who is a professor at the Law School of Gangwon National University, also in Korea, and a lawyer specialized in environmental litigation. Professor Buck has published a comparative study of climate change litigations across the world, as well as an exploration into the institutionalization of the commons. In his presentation, he will make the case for the DMZ and its legal entity, a new understanding of the relationship between human and nature in the perspective of Earth's jurisprudence. Professor Buck, the floor is yours. 네, Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is... Can you... My name is Park Taeyeon, professor at Gangwon University. It gives me a great pleasure to make a presentation here at the forum, and it gives me a great honor So our um, title for this forum is Deepen Development, Environment and Peace Nexus and um, in Peacemaking in Borderlands. And there have been many theories and practices that took place in DMZ. And I'm sure that you're familiar with our effort. However, in terms of peacemaking, is now being combined with the ecological and nature harmony. So this new approach is very enlightening because I am very happy to uh, give, be given this opportunity that I can talk about this new approach. That there are uh, examples uh, shared by Ms. Maria Sanchez. She explained about the various examples um, taking place in the world. So now I'd like to talk about the human and nature in the perspective of Earth jurisprudence. I'd like to use jurisprudence as a mediator. DMZ, Demilitarized Zone, from 1980s, there have been active discussions on the peaceful use of DMZ. In 1989 and in 1992, UNEP and IUCN has been uh, suggesting uh, suggested about forming DMZ as an international natural park. And in 2001, that many practitioners worked to list DMZ, UNESCO Biosphere Reserve. And during Park administration, the administration worked to um, introduce DMZ as a World Ecological Peace Park. And during the current Moon Jae-in administration, uh, the administration aims to uh, build DMZ as a borderland peace belt. Just more specifically, the efforts is to build this area as an eco-friendly um, tourism belt connecting from west to east. From the perspective of the from the perspective of these whole journeys that we can find some commonalities which are ecology, economy, culture, peace, common prosperity between South Korea and North Korea. So these are high values. But I'd like to make an approach 
from a different perspective, not from the human eyes. From the perspective of the Earth's jurisprudence, I would present DMZ this way. I'd like to suggest seeing this space as a system, ecological system. This is the place where human activity is controlled, resulting in biodiversity. There are complex environment and wild ecological status and to preserve uh, this precious environmental sphere that there are many attempts to preserve it as a peace uh, park. And there have been many suggestions in the past, but all these approaches are approaching this uh, park as a park. However, I'd like to suggest seeing this DMZ with a different perspective. I'd like to suggest to see this space as a system. Then we can think it as a single entity. Because single entity has its own interests and values. And this is the relationship between human and the nature suggested by Earth's jurisprudence. So in this concept, there is a concept emerging like life community, a single entity with its own interests and values, and these will emerge as keywords. I think you might find it quite new. Uh, taking a natural source as a single entity and recognizing the single entity as something that has its own rights. And you might think it as uh, quite new or not familiar, but you can find real cases in New Zealand. In New Zealand, um, there is a um, river. Hwanganui River. And there is an act, Te Awa Tupua uh, Act. And Te Awa Tupua Act contains physical and superphysical elements. And this act sees this natural source as an entity. And Te Awa Tupua has been recognized as a legal person. So like human beings, it has rights, powers, and responsibilities. Respo a, rep a representative appointed by the Maui, uh, Maori, Maori community and the representative appointed by the government uh, represent the entity. So these guardians are called te pua, po to pua. And they're representing the entity for the interest of the health and well-being of the river. So based on this example, that we can also recognize the single um, entity, the entity to uh, DMZ then we can consider DMZ as a legal personality, not a being or object being used for the needs of humankind. So if we change our thinking this way and by having guardians who protect or represent the DMZ for the interests and for, uh, for the benefits of the DMZ, that the representatives can work for the entity, then this is a suggestion that I'd like to make. So if we follow this perspective, then our recognition, human beings' consensus, and the legal system will be affected.
Now, I believe that we need to change our fundamental perspective toward the nature. We need to consider the nature as a whole and life support system because it is the reality and it is a value itself. The humankind needs to recognize the reality of the nature as a whole. By giving the natural rights, recognizing the natural rights of the nature, we can transform our recognition and awareness toward the nature. As I said earlier, DMZ is in a natural status. But if we see DMZ from the perspective of private uh, property law, and you will see that some parts are belong to the uh, private owners and some parts are belong to the uh, government, then it will be intertwined legal claims. Of course, there must be some conflicts um, asking for their claims ownerships and to prevent such conflicts suggestion will be including whole land as a state uh, ownership however i would like to make a totally new approach i'd like to suggest that DMZ should be considered as a single entity and it should be given legal personality. Then it doesn't belong to the government, to the country, to the state, or it doesn't belong to individuals. It exists as it is and it is belong to the nature. I... My sound to... Um, ideal and our existing perspective or perception on the nature is that it should be belong to somebody but that is our traditional concept so you might think that my proposal is too um, ideal However, we have to um, change our perspective. But rather, I think giving the rights of the nature to somebody, uh, let's say to the government or to individuals is rather unnatural. So we have to recognize the nature by having non-entrepreneur um, anthropocene perspective then that is the good beginning of the nature uh, harmony with the nature and recognizing such status of the um, nature is going against the, the current disruptive and exploitive system. I'd like to close. This last slide of the presentation is titled Manifesto to DMZ. DMZ belongs to the DMZ. So this is the manifesto for DMZ. Again, I'd like to declare that DMZ belongs to the DMZ. It's simple, but its Copernicusic um, idea is underlying under this slogan, this declaration.
as soon as we declare that DMZ belongs to the DMZ, that the DMZ has historical meaning, not only Korean, but world historical meaning. South Korea and North Korea are not the sovereign powers which have the ownership of the uh, DMZ, but rather our roles will change to become guardians. As guardians and protectors, South Korea and North Korea will consider the best interests for DMZ. And to protect, and also in the um, extent of not damaging the interest of the DMZ, the common interest will be defined for both parties. And in this extent, that um, activities benefiting the DMZ will be permitted. So this will be a good example of specific example of harmony with nature. That's been my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Park, and uh, for making such a strong call for a new perspective and uh, sharing the legal precedents also from New Zealand, making the case for DMZ as a single legal entity. Um, I think going against this kind of mainstream approach is something that is common throughout the presentations we've heard so far, and maybe also a point that is really relevant, not only for Korea and the DMZ, but, but quite beyond, uh, where we need to unlearn the idea of owning nature uh, more generally. Um, now, let me remind all of our listeners just once more uh, that they can already submit questions for our panelists um, before we now move to our final presentation. So last but not least, we'll hear from Wang Jianbao, who is an associate researcher of the Institute for Advanced Humanistic Studies of Beijing University and the director of the Center for the Humanities and Business Ethics of Zhong Kong Graduate School of Business in Beijing. He completed his PhD under the supervision of Professor Tu Wei Ming at the Department of Philosophy Studies and Religious Studies in Peking University in 2017, and then became director of the program for the Discourse on Confucian Entrepreneurs of the World Ethics Institute, also at Peking University. His presentation will focus on responsive and responsible mutuality between the human self and her ecosystem, a perspective of spiritual humanism. Over to the presentation. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's my big honor to attend this marvelous international conference. I am uh, Wang Jianbao from Chang Gong Graduate School of Business. My presentation title is uh, Responsive and Responsible Mutuality Between the Human Self and Her eco Ecosystem, a Perspective of Spiritual Humanism. The outline is as below. Three epochs of Confucianism and three generations of the third epoch. Reflections on the Enlightenment, spiritual humanism, and the ecosystem. Finally, is uh, some simple conclusions. Three epochs of Confucianism and three generations of the third epoch. Confucianism has three epochs from earliest times, not later than Duke Zhou of Zhou Dynasty, through the Han Dynasty as the first epoch. It's nearly 1,200 years. Neo-Confucianism from the Song through the Ming dynasties as the second epoch, and the contemporary Neo-Confucianism from the Opium War to the present as the third epoch. In its first epoch, Confucius succeeded to develop a comprehensive system of moral, ethics, arts, and politics from the primordial rituals and musical teachings with the transcendental humanism. In its second epoch, owing to the fostering and help of Neo Taoism and Buddhism, Confucianism enjoyed a renaissance, developing a system of metaphysics expanding into Asia and cultivating a Confucian culture sphere, including Japan, Korea, Vietnam, and so forth. In its third epoch, Confucianism lost its ideological leadership, retreating to the background of daily life in cultural China. The third epoch of Confucianism is represented by three distinct and distinguished generations. The first generation was represented by Xiong Shidi, etc., who inherited the scholars of the second epoch 
by referring to the spiritual resources of Buddhism and Taoism with few Western references. The second generation was represented by Mozo San, etc., who conducted their research mainly based on the Hellenic philosoph philosophical traditions, such as Mo versus Immanuel Kant, Xu Fuguan versus liberalism, etc. They know a little of Hebrew traditions. As a prominent member of the third generation of contemporary Neo Confucius, Professor Chu Wei Min has deeply penetrated the mindset of the Western world, not only referring to Hellenic traditions, but also Abrahamic traditions, including Christian and Islamic. Spiritual humanism is the fruit of the continuous endeavors of the three generations, implying an ecological turn initiated from the Confucian doctrine, unity of heaven and man, as well as pledging in eternal peace owing to the renaissance of all on the heaven and harmony without the uniformity traditions. The Enlightenment mentality inherited from the post-industrial West has prevailed in much of China's growth over the past century. Quote, China is a civilization masquerading as a nation state obliged by its weakness at the end of the 19th century to adapt to European norms, unquote, is from Lucian Pai. The Enlightenment indeed promotes human progress and the rational science, while it also brought up many problems simultaneously, such as wealth inequality, the decline of social mobility, and ecological destruction. We will not solve these problems if there is only liberty but without justice, only rationality but without compassion, or only the rule of law without the comedy and the ritual. If we only talk about the power, even knowledge is power or soft power, we will remain in dilemmas of hegemony, only relying on power to solve our problems among boundaries. If economic man's rationality prevails, then there's no compassion and justice, but only capital remains and flows across the boundaries. We must overcome the arrogance of Eurocentrism, as well as overcome the absolutist belief that science can solve everything. We should eliminate intellectual arrogance theoretically by recognizing that, that local knowledge and local beliefs are also knowledge. In a word, we need to understand the values of enlightenment, but ultimately surpass the enlightenment mentality also. Liberalism cannot be slavishly followed, but reshaped as per the continuity of being. Rationality is bounded, whereas globalization is boundless. We have only plan A without plan B, because we only have one blue planet. Today, virtually all X-Age civilizations are going through their own distinctive forms of transformation in response to the multiple challenges of modernity. One of the most crucial questions they face is what wisdom they can offer to reorient the human development trajectory of the modern world in light of the growing environmental crisis. Among all these axolated traditions, Confucianism is facing the biggest trouble and the suffering the most. However, after more than half a century, all the axolated traditions, including Confucianism, are surviving and even flourishing. Nowadays, the Confucian economic sphere, initiated by Professor Bin Xiang of CKGSB in 2018, includes mainland China, Japan, Korea, Hong Kong SAR, Macau SAR, and the Taiwan area. The overall GDP of these eight countries and areas as a fear surpassed the USA after nearly two centuries lagging behind the modernized Western bloc. Confucian spirituality is a restless horizon with 5,000 years of continuity, by transforming Buddhism to a Confucian context, China, Japan, Korea, and Vietnam avoided the fate of Buddhist countries like Myanmar or Thailand. Confucianism itself was enriched and enhanced by contact. Similarly, spiritual humanism is the second renaissance of Confucius by learning from Hellenic and Hebrew spiritual allergies. Spiritual humanism brings together four dimensions of the commonly shared human experience, self, community, earth, and heaven, 
in order to define the highest manifestation of human flourishing with humanity then uh, as a hub of this framework. Choose Confucian approach to modernity transcends the Enlightenment mentality without rejecting its gains, reshaping but not blindly following liberalism for the 21st century and rebuilding the identity of cultural China while the practicing the dialogical dialogue and send to send the unisons with other civilizations. Confucianism as a local value could realize her global significance through dialogues among civilizations for the human community. Spiritual humanism realizes three layers of transformation of the core value of Confucian humanity then. First, Confucians should learn from the best of enlightenment values, such as rationality, liberty, legality, and human rights. Learning, not teaching, is manifested by Confucian golden rule. Do not do unto others what you would not have them do unto you. Second, Confucian cultural identities should establish the identity of cultural man via sympathy, justice, ritual, and social harmony. Third, in a new era, all humanity should seek and embrace ecological humanism. Spiritual humanism manages some unique contributions to this new trinity. For example, the Confucian idea of the unity of heaven and man is transformed into an answerable cosmic doctrine or answerable cosmicism to gain global significance. Both Hellenic and Hebrew spiritual allergies could refer to spiritual humanism for their own great transformations and enrich their ecological dimensions. Spiritual humanism, moreover, promotes the global significance of Confucianism itself from these three aspects. A universal language from harmony without uniformity, judiciary communities from all under heaven as theory of ecology, from unity of heaven and man, Spiritual humanism supplies a universal language. Let's take software as an example. The Microsoft system is different from Apple system. The files with different formats cannot be opened and read by either side, but the content of the files are the same once the file is opened by either side finally. Nevertheless, the codes behind the software are still different. Similarly, religious languages are not universal languages, though no interreligion peace, no human kind of peace. Spiritual humanism transforms the tradition of harmony without uniformity and offers a language of learning to be human to overcome the dangers of narrow specialization and abstract inclusiveism. Theoretical resources for cultural identity and the judiciary community are enriched by spiritual humanism as well. Judiciary communities can still pass the limitation and the boundaries of the nation state initiated from Europe, which are characterized by some slogans such as America First or Vive la France. Due to the boundaries of nation states, international peace cannot be guaranteed as long as nationalism and national interest are the first priority. We could maintain internal peace among boundaries by eliminating boundaries if we still pass the global governance based on nation state with Confucian doctrine or on the heaven. The other is not Elias, it's Elta. The other is the other part of me. I need the presence of the other. One is not there without the other, within and without. Spiritual humanism offers a theory of ecology as a theoretical framework Spiritual humanism places humanity then in the center. All four dimensions, self, community, earth, and heaven, are transfused with the active vital power, chi, of humanity then. Responsive and responsible communication between humankind and the nature, beyond the logic of domination, is hence made possible. An important spiritual exercise in the practice of Confucian self-cultivation is to extend our sympathetic feelings so that they encompass an ever-expanding network of human and non-human relatedness under heaven. We must finally do away with 
anthropocentrism with Confucian doctrine, unity of heaven and man, rather than man is the measure of all things. Wang Yangmin likewise insisted that even plants and the roof tiles all have spiritual lives as we do. Professor Du's article on the ecological turn in New Confucian Humanism, Implications for China and the World, was published on Dead Loose 2001 for American Academy of Arts and Sciences. On a practical note, Professor Du initiated the establishment of International Confucian Ecological Alliance, a branch of the International Religious Ecological Alliance created by the Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. Second, owing to the invitation of French President François Hollande in 2015, Professor Tu delivered a speech on behalf of Confucianism on the Summit of Climate Conscious. This summit gathered 40 spiritual leaders from the world to steer the signature of the coming Paris Agreement. Third, a research center on new business civilization was newly established at the Chong Kong Graduate School of Business. Finally, conclusions. While many religions dogmas seek transcendence, Confucianism embraces the concrete living person here and now. Heaven engenders humans complete. Implicit in this reclamation of partnership is the idea that through human effort, heaven's creative vitality can be brought to fruition on earth. As St. Paul says in the epistles to the Romans, we are co-creators. That's the dignity of any human being. Hands in hand, let's solve the problem of the clash of civilizations through a dialogue among civilizations, which drives the extra age civilizations towards a new or the second extra age civilizations. In this shared future, we are all one global family. China, the world's largest emitter, has signaled an intent to strengthen its climate commitments. China has pledged to end its contribution to global heating and achieve carbon neutrality by 2060. Before that, China will adopt more vigorous policies and measures to can increase its climate goal and peak carbon dioxide emissions before 2030. That's all from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jan Bao. Applause also for you. Uh, thank you for rounding off our panel by highlighting how the idea of spiritual humanism can offer an alternative approach that overcomes the notion of nationalism and also for making the case for local knowledge and beliefs. I think it's also great that you ended on a positive note on kind of some progress on climate policy. I think the world really needs to see that. Um, with that, uh, we will now move to the Q&A session. And let me thank, first of all, all of our speakers uh, once more for their great inputs and presentations, and also for keeping so well to our schedule, which gives us nearly 30 minutes now for questions and answers. Um, just to recap, we've heard about quite a broad range of issues, uh, both uh, on the different approaches to nature and to harmony with nature, but also about borderlands and the specific challenges for environmental sustainability and peacemaking in those contexts, with a particular focus on legal challenges and earth jurisprudence. So for our discussion now, I would like us to try and focus on the link between these broad fields to explore how diverse approaches to nature can contribute to peacemaking in borderlands. Um, we are already collecting and sorting through the questions that are being submitted uh, via YouTube, but I would like to get the discussion going with the first round of questions that are based on submissions we had in the conference registration forms. Um, starting maybe with uh, Jambao, who's still kind of fresh at speaking, <laughs> we learned that the ideas around rights of nature and living in harmony with nature are based on ancient traditions of an indigenous peoples or local knowledge, and usually based not only on the relationship with nature, but also based on a sense of mutuality and community that predates modern borders. If we speak about borderlands and peacemaking, do you see an opportunity of using these concepts to create kind of shared worldviews and build solidarity between groups that have been in conflict for quite a long time? You're still muted. Oh, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, 
it's a very good question and uh, also a challenging question. You know, uh, Maria mentioned uh, these uh, indigenous uh, civilizations just now. I fully agree what she said. Uh, actually, recently I'm translating something uh, between uh, Ewald Cousins, Professor Cousins, and Professor Tu uh, Professor Cousins worked in the uh, uh, reservation line of uh, the uh, Native Americans for American Indians. So he was uh, so fond of these uh, civilizations. Uh, as I mentioned just now, the Axe Age civilizations uh, are dominated for human beings in the last uh, uh, two or three millenniums. So in the future, I think we are turning to the second Axe Age civilizations. That means we need the help and uh, we need the inspiration from the local uh, indigenous civilizations to eliminate our arrogance and uh, uh, how to say uh, prejudice. In that case, we could be a kind human being friendly with each other and with our environment. In that case, not only the protection of the environment, but also the eternal peace among the uh, civilizations can be achieved. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I will put the same question to Maria. Maybe you can reflect based on your experience from the UN system and the negotiation between quite a range of different nations. Uh, do you think there is a way to uh, use some of these concepts? You're also still muted. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Thank you. Uh, yes, I think this perspective can help build solidarity and collaboration. Uh, for example, if you take borders, in general, artificial borders, they usually uh, created by humans, they usually uh, choose or select a natural border, right, uh, as a natural marker. And therefore, uh, the groups divide the territory, they uh, decide who lives where, okay, and therefore, in the case of a market, could be a river, could be a mountain. Uh, let's assume it's a river. And so people decide who lives on which side of the river and they access the river for exploitation, uh, or fishing, uh, for utilitarian purposes, right? So uh, in the right of worldview, uh, which is precisely to recognize nature's legal personhood as uh, explained also by Dr. Park, it conveys that nature does not belong to anyone in particular, uh, but that nature is protected for its own intrinsic value, for, for her own sake. Okay. And in doing this, uh, you remove the sense of ownership from nature, over nature, and uh, the sense of exploitation of, of, over nature for, by either group. And therefore, all the groups will have a common place to protect and to collaborate. Okay, and this is very much at the essence of how indigenous people uh, collaborate and relate to each other. Therefore, uh, we need to kind of migrate our mindset to this type of uh, collaboration, interaction, uh, interrelation, uh, in order to share nature and peace with the natural world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria. Uh, I think this uh, makes a great transition also to thinking about some of the legal challenges that come with shifting our mindsets and trying to adopt these new approaches. So a few questions that we receive actually related to this intersectionality between exploitation of nature, human development and peace and borderlands uh, and how to make that work. So how can we actually uh, promote sustainable development in borderland contexts? Um, and maybe I will just hand it over to uh, Professor Kang, given that the legal personality to natural elements uh, is uh, something that is probably defined at the national level, I would assume, in a legal context. Uh, how do we adopt this at a, in a transboundary context? What is the role for national versus international environmental law, for example? Can you uh, elaborate a little bit on that? 
네, 제가 아까 그 발표. Well, that is related to my presentation as well. Uh, from the legal perspective, the right of the nature, if because they didn't have any legal person, so the nature has been devastated, and the right of the nature has not been recognized so far. So we try to, we are trying to protect the nature, and we try to uh, deal with the nature more personally to protect the nature and protect the ecosystem. And it, if we want to make that level of advancement, then we have to get away from, we have to go beyond the existing legal system and to give the legal person to every entity of the nature to protect their legal rights. And for that new legal thought, we have to agree on and achieve a consensus to make the paradigm shift. Under that way of thinking, we can legislate to make the real actions happening. For example, here in Korea, it was quite a long ago, and there was a cases about the environmental protection. We tried to build a highway, and some won the small animals, won the one type of mammals inhabitant was devastated and damaged. And the legal representative of the environmental group uh, sue against that construction work, but before making the ruling that the nature doesn't have any nature right, so that was kicked off at the court. So there was the court, that's kind of cases we had. Their legal basis is that that nature, the animal itself, doesn't have any legal right. So even though it is damaged, even though it is devastated, there was no place for them to complain about. So the concept of a legal person is really important. I think as Dr. Wang Jinbao mentioned that, we have to be very uh, nice to each other and nice to environment. So we have to get away with the concept that we have been very familiar and comfortable with some the state-oriented legal system. And the legal system should expand to include not only the people, but also the companies and entities, organizations, and nature as well. So we have to be very nice and warm-hearted towards the nature and to give legal person and legal status to them. The laws and regulations follow what's happening in the society, and it's kind—it's not only adapter kind of, and we are the lo laws always follow after something happened. So, it should we need to work on regularizing this new system, and there are little uh, cases in the USA and some other countries. Just like that, we need to have some new legal system. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Professor Park, would you like to add something based also on your kind of call for making the DMZ a single legal entity? What are your reflections on how this can be achieved? Mm, I use the case of New Zealand. Yeah, I explained a New Zealand case too. Well, we'd like to give um, legal entity to the whole nature, but that triggers too much um, problems on the existing legal system. So I think New Zealand case is very wise. The harmony with the nature is intertwined with the human day-to-day uh, -day living. So this, for example, this river or a certain place has given the legal entity. So if we see deeper that, that there are people who are willing to live in harmony with the nature, for example, the culture or the norms 
of the indigenous people are respected. For, uh, from the normal perspective, DMZ is demilitarized zone. However, DMZ distinguishes itself from normal uh, natural environment. That is why I argue that DMZ should be given a legal entity, legal personality uh, from, of course, it should uh, go through the legal process. Therefore, all these discussions, which started almost uh, f uh, five years ago in Korea. Uh, this is my feeling, but I think there is an increasing uh, call and also there has been better uh, environment in which that we can uh, freely talk about giving legal uh, rights to the natural resources. So we have to um, talk with the legal uh, legislators and by giving the legal rights to DMZ, the sovereignty between the South Korea and North Korea are not conflicting, but our roles uh, can be sw um, switched to guardians and we can work together to define the roles of the DMZ and also define the meanings of the people living inside in terms and also in terms of the ecology and also co-prosperity and all these things can be developed through a harmonious way. Thank you very much. Um, I think that gives us a good overview of uh, some of the answers already. Um, now, moving on to David, uh, one of the questions we received before the conference was how cross-border development initiatives can be made sustainable so that they do not disrupt uh, nature or people-to-people -people contact. I think maybe uh, your presentation has already touched upon that a little bit. And then we just received a second question uh, regarding borders or borderland issues. Culture and ecology seem to be considered as an afterthought compared to political process or political settlements. Is there any case that you're aware of where ecology or cultural concerns drive the process of political change? Um, yeah, so I think that's an interesting question. That there are cases, um, maybe not so directly related to borderlands, but related to the transition from um, kind of militarization or conflict to peace uh, here in the United States, where we've had um, military bases that have closed and become wildlife refuges. And in a, a number of those cases, the emerging ecologies of those places really drove those um, new designations to, to wildlife refuge. So the, the, the politics are obviously different, but the, um, I think there are some interesting cases there of, of um, kind of nature in a sense, init not, not initiating, but being a, a major spur to the process. Um, and, and we did see some of that early in the transitions in, in Central Europe too, where um, I think people were noticing um, the emergence of these, these uh, the flourishing nature. And so it was at least a, a companion conversation. But I, I think I'm struck by throughout some of these talks and, and issues how there seems to be an underlying problem of kind of dualistic thinking. And if we can break that down and, um, you know, bring nature and culture together into the conversation or humanism, you know, Confucianism and rationalism together rather than having these borders or having a legal system that isn't just um, you know, humans on one side and nature on the other, but bring those together into the same sphere. I think a lot of the, I mean, all the presentations at some level today um, were underpinned by the problem of dualistic thinking. So I think that that might be one sort of more comprehensive way to think about what what changes could really help is to to think of sort of more of a holistic or unifying um, you know, conception. Thank you so much. That uh, brings me right over to uh, Maria and the question that we received. Um, so it was on the 
the, your presentation and the issue of nature as a perceptive being just reflected in the right of nature. The person says, often the attitude of acknowledging the perception of natural objects of the, uh, the earth itself beyond living organisms or species is not universal in existing law or legal practice. So there are diverse recognitions about it. In your presentation, I'd like to ask in what context the perception of nature is recognized. You're still muted, Maria. Thank you. Thank you, Dina. Thank you for the question. Uh, the, perception, the perception of nature currently is recognized in, in law, center law. Uh, is the first discipline where this concept is, is uh, taking root, is being grounded. Okay, it draws from the cosmovision of indigenous people. Okay, it recognizes that nature is not an object, but is a subject of the law. And we use the term good or, or subject of law. And therefore, by recognizing that nature is on equal footing with humans, our relationship towards nature uh, has to change. Uh, you know, long time ago, uh, animals were considered objects. It's just over over time that they were they have been considered sentient beings. Okay, so we are expanding that uh, network or that recognition of, of uh, in the law that is, is everybody is everything what is seen and unseen. We are part of this cosmos and everything is interrelated, and therefore it's not correct that we only give rights to ourselves at the expense of the. This is what we've been doing for probably 500 years. Okay. So we need to find ways to flourish. We need to find ways to find harmony with nature and to do it in harmony with and not at the expense of. That, that's why we find ourselves in this uh, indictment, in this climate uh, emergency, because of our relationship to the natural world. If our relationship had been different, uh, we would be having a different conversation. That's why we are from the knowledge of indigenous people, different spiritualities around the world, like uh, Professor Wang mentioned. Okay, all this is important for the dialogue and for the understanding that we, that the world does not revolve around us. We revolve around the earth. We are a subsystem of the earth. The economic system is a subsystem of the earth, while right now the earth is a servant to all of us, and that that is the you know, that's an incorrect approach. Thank you. It's a very excellent point that cannot be made often enough. I think, um, yeah. I just want to kind of really underline that uh, we have a, a bunch of more questions. So. Um, one is from uh, my colleague El Chongyi, actually, who's been organizing this conference to Professor Kang. Uh, and he's asking if there's any tangible movement or legal discourse to establish a law to give right to nature in South Korea. And if there is, how strong or effective is it in your opinion? In practical, we are making a lot of discourses and efforts to make that happen. I just talk about the cases related to the highway construction. That's a one simple example. And we are making a lot of challenges in many different areas. And the environment, in, environment groups are taking some the plaintiff. And there are a lot of the environmental advocates out there. There's too many cases. So I just want to highlight that there's a lot, many cases here in Korea, but still so far, we have not uh, away, uh, we have not get away from the existing the law in Korea. Or we have no cases to give any legal status or legal person to puppy, mountain, or river in Korea. Whether it's animal or plants, we have never expanded the legal person to a new entity. We haven't reached that level of a conclusion. But as Professor Park Tae-hyun mentioned earlier, 
very recently, the atmosphere has been uh, the created, and people for Earth has made a lot of efforts to create such atmosphere to make our intention realized on the ground. And we are still working on that. I strongly believe that in the near future, we may see the result that we really want to have. We are keep challenging to achieve that. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think we have time for, for one kind of uh, more question, which there are actually two questions for Professor Park Tien. Um, and one is saying that, uh, thanking you for the presentation, which reminds the, the participant of work by Elizabeth Povinelli on geontologies, which should suggest the sovereignty and ontology of nature. In the case of the DMZ, the zone was created by militarized force. So would you say it's still possible for DMZ to make claims to a kind of ontology or sovereignty? And then maybe a little bit similar is, um, the perspective of approaching the DMZ as a community. Um, when you said it maintains its natural wilderness, uh, should be understood as a system rather than a spatial concept. The person asking this question says, if I felt that it was an organism. If so, I wonder if each member of the community, which can be seen as an organism in terms of the relationship between humans and nature, can be recognized as an individual legal entity. So maybe you can just reflect one more time a little bit on uh, the idea of making the DMZ an, an entity and how this can happen given the, the tensions and the context of its uh, militarized history. Well, thank you. Uh, for your question. First of all, giving legal rights to DMZ will make an immediate change in perception, but one, all, one immediate change will be the roles of the South and North Korea. They're activity as the sovereign um, sovereignty holders will change eventually as the the sovereign uh, holders the two countries will compete to have better interest however their role will be transformed to guardians or representatives. The, uh, with the transition of the role or status, they will see that the DMZ's use will be different. In the past, existingly, we use DMZ for certain purposes. However, this changed status will allow us to think about the best benefits for the DMZ. We will define what are the best interests for DMZ and based on uh, the definition, we will continue to evolve thinking what are the economic or what are the social benefits for the human beings. We'll continue to pursue these following values so this will change our perception. Although I say that to you, I think that there is an area of abstraction because it's an open discussion. So this creates governance. So in the context, in the scope of definition, there must be different interests and um, stakeholders' interests. So these um, interests need to be adjusted and in the way the relationship between human and the nature will be seen through a different angle. And as also Ms. Maria said, that um, the human community and the economic community, they are considered, they will now be seen as a subsystem of the earth. And by seeing that, we'll continue to purse uh, humankind's interest in that scope. So this is the direction toward the ecological system. It's a real practical uh, example that we can put in place to 
for us to go forward, ecological civilization. So it's a very important beginning and step for us to go toward ecological civilization. So by making a small changes and steps that we will make a disruption, small disruption. And when these small disruptions are accumulated and we can make a Copern uh, acoustic um, uh, transition, transformation in our thinking, it's an open place. No one can define what's going to happen because it's the future. It's an unknown territory. So this is the direction that we're going to go. And it's a testament, uh, testament of the direction they would like to go. So I believe at the moment that is the approach that we are uh, taking together. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, this brings us uh, right on time to the end of our session. Um, I really learned a lot and I do truly hope that this important discussion would will help us advance the area of Earth's jurisprudence and promoting views that really highlight that we're all part of nature. Um, I think we've heard quite a broad range of uh, things and also calls for really paradigm shifts and different kind of theoretical intellectual discourses around nature, but also some very practical ideas and steps in moving us towards a new era that is more sustainable and in harmony with nature. I do invite all of you to really check out also the other sessions of this conference and get in touch with us uh, to continue this conversation. If you can, please do take the time to fill in the feedback form, which will also be shared through the YouTube comments section. Um, and yeah, let, let me just kind of give another round of applause to all of our speakers and uh, thank you for your great inputs. Uh, thank you for the conference organizers and especially people for Earth for making this organization so smooth despite all of the COVID mishaps and uh, situation. And thank you once more also for the support from Gangwon Provincial Government and Cheowon County Government of the Republic of Korea for making this conference happen. I think it's a really important discussion and debate that we are having and I'm really excited about taking this forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dunya. It's too late for you. <laughs> so kind of you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for everyone. Thank you to everyone. Thank you, Dunya. See you soon. Well, thank you very much to Ms. Dunya Krause for moderating session three. And that was excellent time management. It's a little bit after 12 o'clock. And of course, thank you to the five presenters for joining us all the way from New Jersey, Colorado, and also Shanghai, and also here in the studio with us. Now we have session four coming up in a few hours that will start at three o'clock Korea time and 6 a.m. Greenwich Mean Time. And the topic will be diverse approaches to harmony with nature and their relationship with peace and development. That'll be in about three hours from now, approximately, uh, 3 p.m. Korea time and 6 o'clock Greenwich Mean Time. We hope to see you again soon. We'll see you then.